The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. I'm excited to have Julie here this morning, and it was, it ministers to me when you can feel a corporate people open up their heart, and uh, it takes someone really to, to bring that together. We have a tendency to do in this church is that to make sure that we're not just worshiping all God by ourselves, is that when we come into the corporate setting, that as we worship God, we're also opening our spirits to everybody else in the room so that Jesus can lift his voice through us corporately. And we're still endeavoring to do that at a greater and greater level, that we are including one another in the worship as we lift up our voice, that Jesus might lift his voice through us corporately, that he would sing in the midst of the congregation. So it takes you acknowledging one another. Look to the person to your left and right and just acknowledge there's somebody there. And if there's not somebody there, then you need to pray them in, all right? <laughs> oh. uh, God has been, uh, been speaking one thing to Jennifer and I separately, and for the congregation, something totally different. So I'm going to give you the totally different because that's for you. Uh, what he's speaking to me, I'll, I'll deal with that. Uh, uh, for many, many years, uh, when God said, I'm taking you to the school of the Spirit, he basically would reveal a particular aspect through his word of his nature and his character. And it was like this multifaceted diamond without end, facets without end. But not only was there a different facet that would shine on my heart through the face of Jesus Christ, but I realized that every facet had a depth beyond anything we'll ever know. So you can pursue a aspect of Christ deeper and deeper and richer. You never really know it. You just think you know it. But then you can always, there's more depth and yet there's more aspects. And the thing that he spoke to us this week um, was really that uh, one of the things we want the, the church to be aware of is I believe there will be attack on hope, all right? And I hear sermons on faith and I hear sermons on love, but you don't hear a lot on hope. And in a practical way, hope is the confident expectation of good. And I'm not for formulas because for me, everything's been birthed out of a relationship from the initial encounter to the subsequent relationship. All I know is that the way I see faith for me is a feeling. Faith is a confident assurance. It's an awareness that God is God in me. It's a God confidence as opposed to a self-confidence, but it's a God emotion. It's not carnal emotions. So faith for me is substance and it's reality and you can touch it and you know when it's strong on the inside. Hope, on the other hand, is the opening of the door of the heart and holding it open. Hope and open for me is a spiritual, they're basically synonymous. When I'm open in my heart, hope is holding the heart open. Open to God, open to life, open to other people. And hope deferred makes you sick, correct? That means when you shut the door of your heart and you're listening to somebody with your head because you said, my heart's far from you. And you can do that. You're capable of doing that spiritually. To listen to somebody with your mind but have your heart closed off. But that'll make you sick and that'll affect your physical body as well. So faith, this sounds like a formula. Faith is the substance of the reality of Jesus in you. It's the faith that comes from his very nature. Hope is holding the heart open till what? Faith, hope, what comes next? Faith, hope, love. That love that never fails is going to come through as long as you don't dictate to him exactly how he has to do it and when he has to do it. Hope will hold the heart open till love comes through. And so God's been speaking that there's going to be really an, a, a, an attack on hope. So if circumstances and people start getting under your skin, uh, open your heart that Put your hope in God, not in a particular outcome that you have planned. Hope in him and hold the heart open that love will come through. Love's going to come through. I felt love coming through in the worship service and mercy and forgiveness and everything that God said was mandatory for an environment. And when you create 
that atmosphere, that atmosphere becomes an environment and that environment could change a culture. Amen. Think about that for a little while. You create the fragrance of Christ in your worship and in your life. You create that atmosphere. And if that atmosphere is love, acceptance, forgiveness, grace, and mercy, if that's what you create, then you create an environment. That environment maintained properly through a forgiveness and a repentant lifestyle continuously. Our friend Bill Morford said in his translation of the, of the Bible, what's missing in our Bibles is that word continuously. We see it as choppy little truths when in reality, no, it's a flow of life. And the word of God was meant to be a river and the will of God is a river. So, uh, in saying all of that, uh, faith plus hope equals love's going to come through somehow. Do you believe love's going to come through somehow? We need that childlike faith to where we just say, God, I wonder how you're going to get me out of this mess. But then leave it with loose hands open to him with a God confidence or trust. Trust is the foundation that has to be established in an individual's life for love to come through. Everybody wants more love, but you're not going to have more love until you establish that foundation of trust. So anyway, now, now for the, uh, the double-barrel shotgun that we're going to get this morning. Um, in the process of all the good things that God's been saying to us about hope individually for Jennifer and I, uh, and maybe we're, we'll get around to it someday, just basically teaching on a strategy to come against the tactics of the enemy on trying to uh, remove your hope. But God basically said that uh, this morning, I'm going to give you five deadly seeds, you know, ABC, five deadly seeds that need to be addressed because why? Why do we need this? Because the mandate for full stature ministries has been from its inception to mature the believer. And in a sense, kind of be like John the Baptist. Luke 117 says, he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient, I don't think we have any disobedient people in here, but to turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. For what purpose? To make ready a people prepared. I believe we're on the cusp of an event in God. And if Jesus is going to reveal himself to the church at large, corporately, I believe that it's our job, really, in fivefold ministry, to basically equip the saints, to prepare them in advance for what would happen. So basically what God laid on my heart was that we believe very strongly full stature ministries, Kingdom Life Church, in intentional sanctification. I think we coined that expression. I never heard anybody else use that. Intentional sanctification. Say that back to me. And if you're watching by Ustream, you say it too. Intentional sanctification. Now, what would that mean compared to sanctification? Well, in the past, I had seen and watched people in the church deal with stuff. When they'd have a meltdown, they would deal with it. But when they're having a good day, they usually just kind of enjoy the good day. And I'm saying there is uh, an expedient way to deal with things, and we call it intentional sanctification, and David was a good example of that. David uh, basically said that, Search me, O God, for secret faults. Now, when he said, search me for secret faults, they weren't, they weren't known to him. They were secret to him as well. There's an intentional passion for God to say, I'm doing wonderful, I'm doing great, but I'm asking you intentionally to search me for secret faults so that, the intent, so that I don't create big blunders later on down the road. And so it's basically saying, God, search me for anxious thoughts and hurtful ways. And instead of being man-searched or self-searched, you are God-searched. And that is a primary element. So are you get, getting ready to be prepared? If there's going to be a move of God, I'll tell you what, I can give you some intentional sanctification keys so that you uh, will not be destroyed in the day of the saints. I believe we're living in the day of the saints. Do you believe that? I believe fivefold ministries had their chance uh, and they've all gotten their glory over the decades, right? Healing evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, prophets, apostles. 
all right, but now it's the day of the saints. It's the priesthood of the believer. It's the day where you equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And so um, if, if that is my mission, and it is, right? Uh, I mean, full stature was to probably press people to the limit to where they think, I can't do that. And then when you say that, then we remind you, of course you can't. Only Jesus in you can. So you need to humble yourself to the grace of God who is the empowerment and the ability to do it. So whenever you hear a message and it sounds too hard, it's because you're relying on willpower to do it when in reality you can't do it. God never called you to live the Christian life in your own strength. So are you ready for the five C's? We're going to prepare because I'll tell you, when there's an awakening and there's a preparation, I don't want to have to deal with it then. I don't want to, and plus the fact that this is a selfish motive, I don't want a church full of meltdown peoples who say, oh, the power of God's coming, and I feel garbage, and I feel like, well, deal with it now so that you can stand strong in that day, because I believe there's going to be a work like Charles Finney had that's going to appear in the church. Charles Finney basically had such a rich sense of the presence of God that even without a word spoken, he could walk into a room, usher in the presence of God, and people say, what must I do to be saved? presence evangelism. I know there's power evangelism, and I know there's program evangelism, and they're all valid, but I'm telling you the day's coming when the very fragrance of God is going to do more of the evangelism because it's going to be the presence that's going to speak for itself. And people are going to say, these people must have been with Jesus. All right, so here's the five C's. These are, and we're going to pray through these things because I want in a practical way to equip you, not inform you, um, but... <clears throat> Listen to, before we begin this intentional sanctification, here's three paradigms that our ministry has uh, really endeavored to turn around. Three paradigms, and you might not even think you're guilty of it, but when we minister to people, we see it all the time. Number one, they are self-focused as opposed to God-focused. Paradigm number one. God-focused is that everything you do, you're doing it as unto him. Self-focus is basically what's in it for me. Uh, They say even in the titles of your books, when you publish a book, uh, there needs to be an underlying what's in it for me in the title that appeals to people. It's a shame, but it it is a me generation. But nonetheless, (laughs) nonetheless, then you get in there and you deal with the discipleship and then it's, it's, it's all covered. But I understand that that what's in it for me is still self-focus, when in reality, what God's looking for is someone that basically says, it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. This life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I believe that there's going to be a revelation of Jesus as the sanctifier. And I get a joy bubble when I say it, so I say it again and again, even without reason. Jesus is going to reveal himself as the sanctifier and more of a a work of grace that the church desperately needs. We need more of his Holy Spirit. We need more of that change. So how do we prepare in advance of of the coming of an event? What did John the Baptist tell him to do? Repent, turn around, change your life, get ready. The kingdom of God is at hand. Present tense is the message that Jesus gave. And... So I want to give you five C's, and I want to pray you through these. Because um, the interesting thing is that what God gave me as my very first sermon, my spiritual father had a very large church, and uh, he appointed Dennis to preach his first sermon. And my first sermon was the five C's of a communicator. And ultimately, that's the goal. A real communicator is not just a talker. A communicator is by the life that you live, by the words that you speak, and even the death that you die to the flesh. All right? That speaks. It has a voice. And to reveal Jesus is basically the highest form of communication there is. It's not with the words. It's in demonstration. And it's an expression. So the, those five C's, when I gave the solution, was basically that... Uh, the C number one in order to bring culture shock. If we're going to bring culture shock, remember, what did we say? You create an atmosphere, that atmosphere creates an environment, and that environment can affect a culture. So I'm going to give you the answer before the problem, all right? The answer is, is that there's five C's of 
producing that culture shock as a believer. We, didn't the early church turn the world upside down? It was a culture shock. They were, they were depicting by the anointing of God something the world didn't know what to do with. And they were bringing a whole new way of living. Many, matter of fact, in the beginning, they even called it the way. You know, people that were in the way. Now we have people in the way. All right, no, all right. But, but these five C's of, of culture shock or witnessing to the world. Number one, the first thing God laid on my heart is you must have a touching communion Union, intimate relationship with God. C number one is communion, to commune. We have very many people that are biblically literate, but as far as touching God and having a real intimate relationship, it's lacking. We know more Bible than we know him. That has to change. Worship is a beautiful opportunity to engage that part of you, to touch in the spirit, spirit to spirit, heart to heart, breath to breath, to make it a reality. Truth is reality. All right. The second C in order to bring about this culture shock was conversion. That if you're communicating something and it doesn't produce change lives, you're probably giving information. There's revelation for information. There's revelation for transformation. But God showed me that I wasn't going to preach anything unless it changed lives. Unless it first be the patient before you're the doctor. Many people pride themselves on what they know. But in reality, they don't know. And the sad part is, is they'll even see the gifts of the Spirit as a badge of entitlement. Uh, or as if it was God's touch on your life that because you're gifted but it says lord many will say in that day did i not cast out devils did i not prophesy in your name and he'll say i knew you not depart from me because you work lawlessness lawlessness means you had a will of your own and it was not submitted to mine i don't want sacrifice i want obedience and that's really where god's going so the second one is that if you're going to change the culture you've got to have a christianity that demonstrates what you preach you got to walk the walk not just talk to talk, correct? All right. So C number one is you have to have a, uh, you have to be joined to the Lord. You have to be joined with Him, one spirit with Him, and it needs to be spirit to spirit. Conversion is the second C. The third C that I found to be necessary to bring about culture shock is many people are turned off by religion. But I'll tell you one thing, if it's really Jesus, it will have a magnetic effect that it will cause some to feel guilty and withdraw, but there'll be others that it'll create a desire. And God always used that example that if what you have is real, there will be always those that it'll create a desire like a midwife would do with a baby that wouldn't nurse. They would put oil on their finger and they would tease or massage the baby's palate until it wanted it. So I believe that communication, there has to be something that's desirable about it. They've got to feel the substance on it. There's got to be something that draws. And Jesus said, if I am truly being lifted up, I will draw. I will magnetically draw toward myself. Everybody, probably not, but many will. The ones that it doesn't withdraw, uh, their deeds are evil, and they like the darkness anyway. Uh, that's out of your control. But to present him, he will draw. If I be lifted up, I will draw. He will create a desire. So I believe that if you're going to have the kind of anointing and the kind of Christianity that's going to produce a culture shock, regardless of the world system, regardless of the value system of the world, you're going to have to have deep communion with God. You're going to have to have a life message that basically can change people's lives and see that change and hear testimonies of that change. That's the most fulfilling thing about what God's done for us is because we're not giving information, but we're giving how to do it. And that's really where the rubber meets the road. It's not so much what you know, it's whether or not you've been able to apply it. And then what God had me do was, even after I thought that I had that truth written on the tablet of my heart, he would have me go in hindsight and say, where's the fruit? If that is in fact written on the tablet of your heart, you should be able to validate it by fruit because you will know them by their fruit. And so he basically said, here's the truth, Dennis. Then the next thing he took me in the school of the spirit was I'm going to teach you how to cultivate that truth. But lastly, in hindsight, you're going to look back and see if there was fruit from that cultivation. 
And that, that puts you in a place of responsibility and a place of self-governance that is actually quite healthy because then you're no longer playing church. So I saw that to create a desire was the third element. The fourth element was a, a caring kind of zeal. Now pay attention because I'm going to cover this zeal issue later. A caring kind of zeal. The love of God and the zeal of the Lord. There's a healthy zeal. But it's not what we did. When we traveled church to church, we ministered mostly to pastors, sometimes as many as, as what did we used to do when they put us in an upper room? 50. 50 pastors in two and a half days. Some of them only needed a 15-minute ministry session. But by and large, because they were working for God, burnout was far too prevalent. And one of the strategies in the end times is to wear out the saints of the Most High God. That is still, if he can't get you to backslide, he's going to wear you out. He really wants to do that. And so willpower has to be thoroughly understood as a surrender, for it is God who is at work both to will and to do. And until you learn how to do that spiritually, you're a candidate for stress and burnout. And by the way, I know men aren't into emotions, but we're into the God emotions in this church, and stress means you are being emotionally controlled. Men don't like that. They usually get an altar call on that. Men, when you're stressed, that means you're being emotionally controlled by other people or circumstances, not God. You can't be stressed and trusting God at the same time. Now I got them all mad. If you're watching by Ustream, I'm going to repeat it. You cannot be stressed and trusting God at the same moment. It's impossible. One is a deep-seated release and relaxation and a God confidence, and the other one is I'm going to try harder. Pride will always try harder. And we don't want to get back to the simplicity of Christ. Pride is always rooted in Satan. Humility is always rooted in God. Oh, isn't that simple? Now, if we would all just be humble... We would have the solution to all spiritual things that ail us. All right. So this caring kind of zeal, God basically demonstrated. I, I call it a violent love myself. I believe God, the kingdom of God suffers violence and a violent take. I believe those are lovers. Lovers and peacemakers. And peacemakers can't be a peacemaker unless you've learned how to effectively wage war. And you can't wage war effectively unless you won the battle within before you will win the battle without. That's more than enough right there, isn't it? All right, this caring love was in Romans 5, 8. God demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. That's a violent kind of love, isn't it? That's, a, that's showing you how significantly valuable you are, intrinsically valuable. Before you developed character, before you developed and grew, you were intrinsically like gold. The value is there no matter what shape or what form it is. That's the starting place in God. All right? So the caring kind of zeal is the fourth C. I'm going to have to go faster than this. The fifth one is the fact that it constructs lives. Jesus himself gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints. Listen to this because a lot of times we don't hear this part. The fivefold (laughs) ministers are to be coaches, not hierarchy, coaches to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. So that means their responsibility is to teach you to stand on your own two feet in self-governance. And in doing so, you basically have for the edifying of the body till we come to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the God unto a mature man. And that's basically our mission always has been, it hasn't changed, 38 years, is that, is that we don't give baby food and we don't baby you. Although we're well aware that you need nurture before you can be fathered. How many know that? What, what, what do I mean by nurture? Nurture means you have to feel safe and secure before you're going to open your heart up. Otherwise, you're going to put walls and go, hey, I don't listen to him. All right, I'm not going to listen to her. All right? But when you... Create an environment that's safe and secure. Then you can pull the gold out of people. Then you can father them. You can basically say, all right, it's time for you to stand on your own two feet. And you don't know what you can do until you've been given opportunity to do it. To stand, to fall, to make mistakes, and to unpack your potential. Now, uh, school teachers do the fathering. 
they can, mom, mom can pack your little jelly sandwich before you leave and make you feel safe and secure. And all the kids have jelly sandwiches and they all feel like, oh, mom took care of us all equally. And then you go to school and they have a pop quiz. And you go, I don't like this part. That's the fathering part. Whether it's a male or female teacher, that's the fathering part. And what they're pulling out is your potential. They want you to see what's in there. They want to see what you're capable of. And testing is significant. So in constructing lives, we need the supernatural love of God that will both create the nurture that's necessary, the safety and the security in the environment, but at the same time, a demand and an expectation for self-governance. And even what we teach, very rarely do we minister to you. We teach you to tap into the Christ in you. We do self-deliverance. We will teach you how to take care of your... It's like spiritual hygiene. Uh, we've gotten to the church where we've almost brushed their teeth for them. Where <laughs> in reality, you should be only going to the specialist for root canals. All right? You should be doing your own brushing of the teeth and your own oral care. All right? So you see those five C's. That's basically the goal. That I believe that there has to be a rich communion with God. In order to produce this culture shock, in order to be a people that are mature, in order to be all that God created you to be, I believe those five C's are ones who will witness to the world or communicate, demonstrate the presence of Jesus to a dying world. Now, here's the thing that God basically told us this week. There are five C's that I need to minister to if you want intentional sanctification. These are the things that will hinder you in the days ahead as Jesus begins to make himself known to his church by revelation, whether it comes in waves of revelation, waves of anointing, waves of, um, of, of glory. Nonetheless, don't you want to be prepared as possible? And isn't it true that throughout history there's never been a move of God that wasn't preceded by repentance? Never. Repentance always preceded. There always had to be a change of heart to make ready a people prepared. Now, here's the first C. These are the five deadly C sins that will destroy the day of the saints if you let it. Shake your head and don't say, I'm not going to let this. I don't even know what he's talking about yet, but I'm not going to let it. I'm going to deal with these things. The number one C that will hinder intentional sanctification is covetousness. Any coveting in your heart. But don't search yourself. Don't be a navel starer. Ask the Holy Spirit, search me. Do like David. Intentional sanctification says, I'm not aware of any. People say that all the time. I don't need, any, I don't need to forgive anybody. I don't have anybody to forgive. Okay, close your eyes, ask God. Or worse, if you're married, ask your husband or wife. We did that in the church where we did the whole staff Remember, that was funny. I don't know why I'm in here because I don't have, I've forgiven everybody. Maybe those other people on the staff need this, but I don't need this. And her husband was in the room. And he goes, oh yeah, what about the kids when they don't come home for Thanksgiving? Well, what about the neighbor when he didn't return the shovel? And all of a sudden there's this manifestation of this person who had nothing to deal with. So <laughs> you can't trust in your intellect in those 2,000 brain patterns that are operating at any given time. You need to say, Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, you knit me together in my mother's womb. You search me in the 400 billion non-conscious areas. You let Jesus search the heart, not man, okay? So, and by the way, when I say let Jesus search the heart, not man, that means you. You and your intellect. You don't know. You don't know enough. But the Holy Spirit made you. He knit you together. If there's knots to untangle, he will find them. He'll put his finger on them very lovingly. So, the first thing is to covet. We're going to pray through these. The second one, remember we said that the end goal, or the end game was this caring kind of zeal, this zeal of the Lord of hosts. But that's the opposite of the zeal of the flesh. And I saw competition. Uh, how many have ever seen a Dake's Bible? Have you ever seen Dake? He used to comment on everything. Every verse he had a comment. All right. But the one that stuck with me through the years was on the works of the flesh, there's a word called emulation. Emulation is an old King James word, but it's a form of jealousy. But in the Greek, it's zeloi, and it comes from the word zeal. And his definition stuck with me to this day. It's an uncurbed 
competitive rivalry spirit in business and religion. Uncurved means the competition spirit is out of control. And it's a form of, it's been interpreted as jealousy in uh, many other parts of the Bible, but an uncurbed rivalry spirit. So on the one hand, we want to enter into the zeal of the Lord. And on the other hand, we don't want the zeal of the flesh. Because one's an imitation of the anointing. It's a counterfeit. It's what we would call hype. And so God's saying, look out, watch out for that uncurbed rivalry spirit. Galatians 5.19. The works of the flesh are obvious. They are immorality, impurity, indecency, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, jealousy, or as the King James would say, emulation. So coveting would be the first C that we need to say, God, search my heart because I want to eradicate that because that will affect my future, and the, and the blessing of God upon my life. The second C is competition. Any search for me for any jealousy, actually all of these have jealousy in them, but search me for any competitiveness, any rivalry, any selfish ambition. The third C is comparing. What did Paul say? Comparing ourselves amongst ourselves, it's foolishness. But when you start comparing, your focus is no longer on Jesus. You're putting it on man. And therein lies a major foolishness because then the standard is, is you're moving away from your uniqueness as an individual and who God created you to do and the plans and the purposes, and you're busy comparing with how you measure up to other people. Actually, that violates the work of the cross of justification. That's the performance trap. Because justification means that I am deeply loved, 100% loved, fully, fully and deeply loved by God. And others would say, if that's not been dealt with properly through the work of the cross, you will say, I must meet a certain standard to feel good about myself. Let that one sink in. I must meet a certain standard to feel good about myself. No, the only standard is the cross of Jesus Christ. The only standard is his standard. We have people in ministry who put demands and expectations on themselves that Jesus never put on them. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Don't be taking on demands and expectations. That will trip you up. And the enemy wants to wear out the saints of the Most High God. But they that know their God intimately will be strong and do exploits. All right? So we have coveting, Competing, comparing, oh yeah, the fourth C, covering. That's when God tells you something, you go, la, 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 I don't want to hear it, all right? You pretend like it's not there. What? I don't have a problem. I've forgiven everybody, all right, that kind of thing. When you cover your stuff, you're still in the place to where your life message can't speak, so therefore you speak with a persona of what you think other people want to see and hear. But it's, it's basically a false face. What did we call false faces in uh, Jesus' day? Hypocrisy. He said the Pharisees had a false face, or they were hypocrites, okay? Pretenders. So com coveting, competing, comparing, covering, which is hiding or denial. You say that I'm rich and become wealthy and then needed nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Okay. So that's people that are hiding. The fifth element, complaining. Now, we know the story of the children of Israel in the wilderness, don't we? Complaining causes circles. And you can go around the mountain as long as you want to complain. You, complaining causes circles. You will go in circles. But God's solution is basically that we're going to learn to conduct ourselves without covetousness. We're going to be content in whatever situation we're in, and we're going to move into intentional sanctification. And I really believe our battle cry is going to be Psalm 19. That's a good one for everyone to spend some time on. I mean weeks. Psalm 19, who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me, and then I will be blameless of great transgression. What is he saying? He's saying, I'm, I'm, 
I want God to give me a checkup. When we used to minister traveling church to church, primarily when they would have us minister to the pastors in those meetings, those were networks of churches that came together and then the leaders would come. Basically, they were looking, they were doing fine. They weren't all in bad shape. In other words, they were healthy enough to say, I think I need a checkup. I'm going to get a second opinion. All right, let's pray. Let's see if anything. And then they would share stuff that normally you can't share. You certainly aren't going to share it on, from the pulpit on Sunday. That's not necessary. All right? There's certain things you don't tell your children, right, that you, as parents you would just deal with it, that they're not ready to handle that. You don't tell them about your insurance problems and how you can't pay the premium when they're two years old. All right? Unless you want to make them uh, very... Very strange later, all right? <laughs> when they're six and they go out and get a job to support you, then they will all right. But Psalm 19, verses 12 and 13, talks about the transgression. I like this in the New Living Translation, Psalm 19, verses 12 and 13. How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. Then I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sins. Isn't that a beautiful translation? It's basically saying, I'm not afraid for you to search my heart. I'm having a great day. But I have this intentional sanctification that I want passionately pursue God. And especially when the good things are coming down the pike, I don't want to be bogged down. Have you ever wondered if you got bummed out during a day what you missed that day? while you were being bummed out. There might have been some really good things happening to everybody else around you, but you didn't know it because you spent the day bummed out. You can't get that day back. It's gone. Too late. You missed it. I don't want to miss life. Deal quickly. All right? So, search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know. And here's something that Jennifer found that's probably the, the heart of our ministry is... Biology has changed in school from what I was taught. Uh, I was taught this almighty brain controls everything, but they're saying, no, no, no. They're saying, emo cognition, emo volition. And that's standard concept now. That's new to me. The emotions control your thinking, and the emotions control your choices. Now, for me, it explains much more of the Bible. It explains Romans 7. Mind will. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, oh, those things I do. But the emotions are the gateway. Jonathan Edwards said the emotions are the gateway to knowing God. That was his observation at the First Great Awakening. He says, apparently the people that were unchanged were impacted emotionally to no degree. Even if they gave mental assent to what God was speaking. But the ones that wept, the ones that even had manifestations that seemed strange and bizarre, were also the ones that had to change lives afterwards. And so as an intellect, he said, though he were an intellect, he said, I believe the emotions are the gateway to knowing God. Interesting. Interesting, because God says that we're connected. You can't separate one. Men don't like to talk about emotions. They, have, they think that's a woman thing. But stress is an emotion, and men are living in unnecessary stress. Stress means you are being emotionally controlled by people or circumstances. And that's not the lordship of Jesus. Let the peace of God rule is the lordship of Jesus. So I basically feel that what God's saying is that there's going to be overflowing vessels, that we're going to be a transfigured fullness people. You like that term? A transfigured fullness people that it's going to be able to create an atmosphere corporately that will create an environment or a spiritual greenhouse that's conducive to maturity and even healing. We've seen people get uh, healing um, without anyone actually even ministering to them specifically just in the atmosphere. Hmm? Physical and emotional, yeah. And it's been a beautiful thing to watch because that's changed lives. So the atmosphere creates an environment like a spiritual greenhouse saturated with the fruit of the spirit that nurtures that spiritual growth. But lastly, these believers then form a cohesive group of people to impact a culture. They share common beliefs, values. Hmm? The definition of a culture is an integrated pattern of human knowledge, belief, and behavior 
that depends upon man's capacity for learning and transmitting that knowledge to succeeding generations. See, our whole goal is generational, that we want, and we have seen this already, we've seen it with the children at Morningstar from K through 12, they caught it faster than the adults in my generation. Why? Because you're not re-educating, you're educating. Am I right? And when we traveled, children responded better than, because the, the adults would go, oh, I, don't know. I never did it that way before, and I don't understand. And they waste too much time figuring out rather than opening their heart and say, God, show me. Wisdom searches out a matter. God, if that's you, show me, teach me, guide me. So um, I believe that what we're going to do is we're going to provide that culture shock. The term was coined in the 1960s and it refers to a sense of confusion and uncertainty <laughs> during that time, and it was. But it's going to be culture against culture. On the day of Pentecost, it was a cultural shock to the current culture. And that's what we need again. And God's basically saying, he's given us the five C's of what it should look like. People that have been with Jesus should be able to be communicators, demonstrators, living witnesses, living epistles, not just uh, people with the right answers or not very appealing anyway. All right? <laughs> but I want to pray through. I purposely wanted to cut the sermon short because I want a practical application of these five C's. How many are, are willing to allow the Holy Spirit to search their heart right now? And we're going to search for those five C's, and I want you to only deal with the one that comes to the surface. If you're watching by Ustream, you need to deal too, all right? I'm going to go over those five C's slowly, five deadly sins that would like to destroy your future. All right? If you're watching by Ustream, wherever you're at, just close your eyes, just drop down in his spirit, and just relax and open yourself to God within, Christ within. And say, God, if there's any coveting in my life, I want it to just pop up to my head, any situation, anything that I want, any agenda, because it can become idolatry even if it's a good thing, if I'm holding too tightly? Is there covetousness? Is there something that I would just die if it were taken? And can I release it? Slip up your hand if you've got something. Something you see coveting, that's good. Okay, let's deal with coveting then right now. Here's the way you do it. You picture that thing person, situation. You picture it in your mind. We're all connected, mind, will, and emotions. And then from your heart right now, I let, allow, not try. I let, I allow the Christ in me. I release, well, I release it into the loving, capable hands of God. It's like out of my belly flows rivers of release. It's like a spiritual jubilee. I am releasing that thing back into the loving hands of God. And the only trip here is no strings attached. If you really give it to him, you give it to him without reserve. I release. Jennifer did this with our daughter once. She released Allison into the loving hands of God and was still frustrated. And I said, something's wrong. And she goes, well, I released her into God's hands as long as she didn't do this and as long as she didn't do that and as long as she didn't do that. I said, that's not release, all right? That's conditional. So, Father, I release anything I'm coveting right now back into the loving hands of God. You may be a steward or a manager, but you're not an owner. So, therefore, I release it to the perfect will of God. How about taking it a second step I receive forgiveness. This is personal responsibility. This will teach, teach you self-governance. I receive forgiveness for having held on to that and coveted that to such a degree. I receive forgiveness for that kind of control. I yield. Oh, now the atmosphere just changed in the room. That's good. You probably needed that part more than the other. I receive forgiveness for taking it in the first place. 
Knowingly or unknowingly, these things creep in. Secondly, competition, competing, zeal. The wrong zeal, not the zeal of the Lord of hosts, not the zeal of the anointing, but the zeal of the flesh. As Jennifer would teach it, she said that's basically the dopamine rush. I release, I release that zeal back into the loving hands of God. I want God to be at work in me both to will and to perform. Are you going to let God perform through you or are you going to perform for God? I receive forgiveness for being a selfer. <laughs> this is like the selfer's prayer. It's like a sinner's prayer, but this is for believers. I receive forgiveness for having tried to live the Christian life in my own strength. I'm a selfer. Does this sound like an AA meeting? Forgive me, God, I'm a selfer. I've been trying to live the Christian life in my own strength. I receive forgiveness down low. We've seen people that were burned out in ministry go back the very next day after praying this. Can you imagine that being that quick? Standard procedure would say, oh, if they've been burned out, they need to sit for a long time. We've seen them if it's properly dealt with in the heart. Sitting won't do anything by itself. It's what you're doing on the inside that's going to determine change. I've seen pastors that were sat down and they didn't do nothing the whole time they sat down. I've seen children go into timeout boxes. They were still standing up even though they were sitting in timeout. We need to bring a new dimension to that to where you say, you come out of the timeout box when you've forgiven, when there's redemption, when there's change on the inside. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, right now, I receive forgiveness for having knowingly or unknowingly entered into an uncurbed rivalry spirit in religion or business. You know, God can accomplish more with less effort. We're not talking about a good work ethic here. I'm all for a good work ethic, but you can accomplish more with less effort from the place of peace than you can from the place of being stressed. Jennifer says when you're stressed, you lose 20 IQ points. Salesmen that are stressed forget clients' names, addresses, they forget stuff. So Father, right now we release any demand or expectation that we're putting on ourselves to compete. I am what I am by the grace of God and I like me. Let's say that out loud. I am what I am by the grace of God and I like me. Through the work of the cross, that's called regeneration. I am what I am by the grace of God and I like me. All right. Comparing. Anybody ever do this? Comparing? I was here first. Hmm? Comparing themselves amongst themselves, they prove unwise. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart. Don't just think. Ask him, search my heart, God. Have I been guilty of comparing myself with whosoever? Slip up your hand if you've seen anybody you've compared yourself to. See how easy this is? We didn't have to spend a half hour. I used to know people used to go on retreats for days to get one thing. You can get it in minutes or seconds if you let God search your heart. Okay? Let's pray that through then. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I receive forgiveness. It's like I'm drinking in from my spirit Christ the forgiver to cleanse and purify me. Purify me and cleanse me from comparing myself with anyone else. I receive forgiveness. I release them as well. If it's a person, I release them. Otherwise, you're making idolatry. Their example is a good thing, but not comparing yourself with them. Fourth C, hiding, covering. Love will cover a multitude of sin, but when you start covering it, that's not love. All right, when you're hiding, you're in denial. 
It's all those other people that need it. Husbands and wives, wives like to change the husband, husbands like to change the wives. But God says, you deal with you. You are responsible for you. So Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to search me for anxious thoughts, anxious thoughts, emocognition, anxious thoughts, hurtful choices, hurtful ways. Do you see the emocognition? Emo volition, right in that scripture. Emo cognition, emo volition. Anxious, what kind of thoughts? Anxious thoughts. What kind of ways or actions? Hurtful ways. That's the New American Standard. Psalm 139. I receive, I receive forgiveness, and I welcome God to search my heart. Areas that I didn't even know was there. Raise your hand if all of a sudden something popped up that you, wouldn't, you never thought about before recently. Okay, very good. My goodness, we're going to be prepared. We're going to be a people made ready. I receive forgiveness for living in denial or hiding in any way, shape, or form. I welcome the Christ in me to search my heart. And whatever he puts his finger on, I receive forgiveness and I release myself to the light of his face spirit to spirit the fifth this is the one that causes you to walk in circles complaining close your eyes just drop down to your spirit and ask God to search your heart what do I have a tendency? Let's go for the repetitive complaining. What is, by the way, a pet peeve is something you need to deal with. Pet peeves mean it's a recurring complaint, a recurring irritation. Why not resolve it? How many got something? Oh, I just love it. Boy, you people are so... You people need saved, I think. I don't know. I saw too many hands here. <laughs> All right. We're going to get ready, aren't we? So, Father, we just thank you that put a guard upon our lips and upon our mouth. Our lips and our mouth, same thing. And let us just speak words of life, encouragement, to comfort, edify, and encourage. In the name of Jesus. Anybody can find faults. Fault finding is not a gift. All right. But when I think God search your heart, and if you're willing to be the patient and say, God, deal with my complaining, deal with my complaining and my control, and I will live for you and serve you all the days of my life. Let's stand to our feet right now and just do that together. Father, I believe that we're on the, the beginning of a major event in Jesus. And however it manifests itself to us, the church of Jesus Christ, I want to be a people prepared. I, don't, I want to be like the virgins who have the oil. I don't want to be the one looking around at the last minute as to how I can get ready. But Father, cleanse us and let those five C's, those five C's not interfere with us being a quality communicator and demonstrator of the gospel of the kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.